So again, uh, say good to Gweo and Marade Young Cats. Uh, my family is Mohawk of the Bay of Quinty, and I work for Reef um, for Feast. Um, I wanted to get us started with just a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, there's three rules today. Uh, firstly, please be respectful to other participants. Um, secondly, please be mindful to have your mic and video turned off during the conversation. And I see that everyone is coming in in a really respectful way. Thank you so much for doing that today. Um, and then also, please be inquisitive. Uh, we have our chat box. Um, please put any questions that you might have into the chat during the conversation. And once we get to the Q&A after the conversation, we'll um, definitely pull up our questions questions and those will be first come first serve so whoever writes first in the chat box will have their answer their question answered first and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of your questions by the end of our q a session today um i'll take a few minutes to introduce our speakers uh sitting with me right now is john schellingberg john is a research associate associate at the university of saskatchewan who studies infectious disease. Um, all of our speakers have years of experience as community leaders supporting 2S LGBTQ plus peoples and have a deep understanding of infectious disease, including um, other STBBIs and also um, personal experience with understanding mon monkeypox in their workplace. Uh, we also have Albert Beck, who's the director of 60s Scoop from the Métis Federation. And shortly, Daryl Tan, an infectious disease physician from St. Michael's Hospital, will be joining us. I'd also like to introduce our elder today. This is Catherine Martin. Uh, Catherine is going to be our moderator today. Elder Catherine Martin is a member of Melbrook Mi'kmaq community. She is the director of Indigenous Community Engagement at Dalhousie University and is an elder on the Feast Center of STBBI Research Elders Council. She has been working with CAN since its inception and is a filmmaker whose films have been focused on Mi'kmaq traditions and life. She has written She's also a recipient of the Order of Canada. Um, I'd also like to um, just do a very brief land acknowledgement um, to recognize my own ancestors and also the ancestors of these territories. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and other nations. What's now known as Paradise Point, located at the McMaster campus, was once a place where dozens of families would meet to gather wild rice for generations prior to colonialism. We're gathering today virtually from many locations across Canada, but all of these locations are originally Indigenous lands and are now shared with settlers and peoples from across the globe. It's important to say that tomorrow is Canada's second annual Truth and Reconciliation Day, a day to honor our residential school survivors and educate the public on the pain and trauma of the residential school system and other colonial tools that were created to assimilate Indigenous peoples. I would like to take a minute of silence in respect and in memory of the thousands of Indigenous children whose lives were lost due to the residential school system the thousands of Indigenous elders and folks who survived the system and continue to move forward through the trauma, and the thousands of us who carry the generational trauma of the school system in our blood and bones. So we'll just take a minute uh, to think about all of these folks and in respect and honor. I'd like to now pass the mic to Catherine Martin, who will open our conversation with a prayer. Hmm. 
Catherine, are you there? I am. I'm just trying to find my way back in here. Oh, no. Okay. There's you're right. always tech issues. Always. I've had, I've had my fair share of them today. So as you can see, I have had to stop beside, stop at the Gold River Mi'kmaq community. I'm in front of their beautiful coffee bean cafe <laughs> here in Mi'kmaq. And I'm here for lots of reasons. I'm not going to tell you all why, but uh, they're closed, of course, because of all kinds of electrical issues. We've got lots of technical issues in the Maritimes, as you can well imagine. Medawalokdiok, Nin Gadalinan Maltai, Welagiskok. Hello, welcome to everybody. My name's Catherine Martin, and uh, I thank everybody for attending today. And I look forward to not just being, uh, you know, a moderator, but to actually learn a lot of things that I think many of us are hoping to get enlightened by. I want to open with a chant that we sing whenever we gather as nations and whenever we gather to celebrate here in Mi'kmaq, a, a chant that was taught to me by the el late elder Sarah Denny of Eskasoni, who committed mm -hmm her life to bringing back our traditions and our language and our, our culture um, and held on to it during the time in this country that it was illegal and against the law and punishable and you could be fined and jailed for this. So I thank her always for the work she's done to bring us back to where we should have always been. So the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth, and today we're going to hear from our very first language, the language of the heart, and the people that are coming to speak to us are coming because they speak from their hearts and they work from their hearts in trying to help others to, to be comfortable on this earth. One no day. One no day, one no day, one no danahi. Guanalia, guano danahi. Guanalia, guano danahi. Guanalia, guano day. Guanalia guano day. Guanalia guano da day. Ego egane. Ego egana. Guanalia guano da Guanalia guano de Guanalia guano de Guanalia guano da de Yoka de Yoka. Guanalia guano danahi. Guanalia guano danahi. Guanalia guano de. Guanalia guano de. Guanalia guano da. And also, as many of you know, the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth, of Mother Nature, and the heartbeat of our mothers. And the very first language that we all heard and learned was the language of our mother. And that's the heartbeat. So whenever we speak from our heart, we're speaking our mother's 
language that we were all first taught. And um, when we go back and, and work hard to speak from our heart, uh, everybody can understand what we're talking about. And it also helps when I sing to get everybody at one level and to calm down and to really focus and, and enjoy your time. So with that, I'm going to ask um, a little bit of uh, guidance here to where we're going next. I'd like to introduce Daryl Tan, who is an infectious disease physician at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And um, Daryl will explain what is monkeypox and um, do an overview of uh, what exactly this is. I'd like to also say thank you, Miranda, for all the work you've done to bring us here. I know it's been a lot of work trying to gather these kittens together. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Miranda, for the introduction. And um, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for the beautiful prayer and, and song. I, I agree. It was definitely calming for me because I've just come from a hectic clinic that ran a bit over time and led me to join us a few minutes late. I apologize for that, but I thank you for bringing me back. Um, I'll, um, uh, and of course, I want to thank everyone here for showing up today. It's 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 wonderful to have a, a great turnout uh, from from across the country. Uh, I uh, I'll introduce myself first. So um, my name is Daryl Tan. I'm an infectious diseases physician. I'm a clinician scientist. I work at St. Michael's Hospital, and I'm an associate prof of medicine at University of Toronto. And uh, of course, that means that I live and, and work in uh, Tikaranto on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Huron, Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and I'm uh, really privileged to do so. And I'm privileged to be here today with, um, uh, with all of you and invited by Feast and with my amazing colleagues, um, uh, Albert and, and, and John, who we'll be hearing from as well, um, to talk about. Um, uh, mpox. I'm going to call it mpox uh, instead of uh, monkeypox. That is what we're talking about, but I'm going to call it that because um, there's been a lot of um, discussion around, you know, how we should best term this thing. Uh, the name itself uh, has some has some issues. There's a lot of layers of stigma that uh, have been associated with it, whether it's intentional or not, in the naming of uh, of uh, of that primate of that animal. And um, and, and actually, it, it weaves in nicely with you know the the introductory comments that Miranda's asked me to to speak about, which is you know what what the heck is this thing? So I'll try my best to explain a little bit about you know what this virus is, what this infection is, and then what's been happening in our context, uh, our contexts, um, because it really does vary from from place to place um, on this uh, on this continent and around the world. Um, and then I'm really looking forward in the, in the kind of next segment for us to all do a little bit of reflection, which, um, which I'm happy to do alongside my colleagues as well. So first of all, you know, what, what the heck is this thing that we call um, uh, monkeypox or, or mpox? Well, it's a virus. Um, so the full name is uh, monkeypox virus, okay? Uh, MPXV is how we write that out in order to try to just uh, be a bit more uh, neutral in how we term this thing. And it's what we call an orthopox virus. That's just kind of um, classification, um, nomenclature, taxonomy that scientists come up with for how to name this thing. But uh, that uh, is, is, is relevant because another very famous uh, orthopox virus, another virus that's very closely related to, is, um, you know, tragically uh, and, um, horrifically re related to the history of, of indigenous people uh, on this continent. So, and that's, I'm referring of course to smallpox. So I think it's really important for us to kind of really pause and recognize uh, and think about the, you know, horrific le legacy uh, of um, what um, previous uh, settlers to this land uh, intentionally did to, uh, to indigenous people with a very closely related virus, which is smallpox virus, through the supposed you know, gifting um, of 
of objects that were, uh, you know, things like blankets and, and other, you know, cloths, linens that we now know, and even at the time was, was known to be a, a vector, a means of transmitting uh, that virus as an agent essentially of biological warfare, um, and to do so really, um, you know, um, uh, surreptitiously, but intentionally. So, you know, when we're talking today about MPOX is very closely related to virus, I think a lot of that legacy, you know, rings true. It has led to a lot of scientific questions that we, I think, are still trying to answer as a, as a community right now that are, are relevant to us to think about. Um, but I, I thought I would start by just drawing that connection because it obviously uh, the, the legacy of that lives on today. This particular virus um, it has been was first discovered in a lab in Denmark, okay, uh, about half a little more than half a century ago. Actually, a little more than that, even uh, certainly er early in the in the last century, in the twentieth century. And it was in a, in a lab, I don't, I don't know the exact nature of the laboratory in which this was this work was being done, but uh, it was first isolated from a monkey. Okay, and it's for that reason that the, the virus and the disease still have that name. It's kind of a weird accident of history that that happened because what we now know is that uh, this virus normally lives in animals, that, but, but not monkeys. So we, we, we think of this as a, a virus um, that historically lived probably in, uh, lives on in, in rodents. We don't quite know what the, what we call animal reservoir or reservoirs are, um, but uh, it, that's where it was first isolated. And it was only in the uh, middle of the last century that it was definitively isolated from humans for the first time. Uh, and that was in uh, certain parts of uh, Central and West Africa. So specifically some of the uh, countries that have been most affected historically have included uh, DRC, so the Democrat Democratic Republic of Congo, some of the neighboring countries there, Cameroon, Gabon, Central African Republic, um, Congo Brazzaville, and then also in West Africa as well. So one of the most prominent countries that has seen a large number of cases was Nigeria. Also, again, the Western parts of Cameroon, a little bit in, you know, uh, in Benin, um, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, other countries in West Africa. And uh, the biggest uh, outbreaks um, that had, had happened um, had been, you know, uh, in, in the latter part of the 20th century. And then more recently, you know, there's a little bit of re-emergence, as we say, uh, of this in Nigeria a few years ago, 2017, 2018. But all the way along, what was understood was that this was kind of related to spillover, it's called, events, where uh, the virus, because, of, uh, because it was, you know, hanging out in, in rodents and animals, but those animals were in contact sometimes with humans, uh, then it would cause uh, infections in humans. Uh, so we call that in, in medicine a zoonotic infection, so it's an, a, an infection that was transmitted to humans from animals is called a, a zoonosis, so it's a zoonotic transmission. And that was probably happening repeatedly and was happening maybe more frequently as human activity started to put animals and humans in, in closer and closer contact more frequently. So things like deforestation, uh, climate change, urbanization, travel, um, uh, different practices like that, that that led to more and more contact. And of course, this is the history of many infectious diseases and many epidemics. Of course, uh, COVID uh, is, is a great uh, example of that spillover from animals into humans, uh, leading to uh, a widespread human to human transmission. So that's a tiny bit of kind of the, the history of, of, of what, what we first learned about this virus. But of course, that was really not on many people's radar. And the history, again, of kind of neglected tropical diseases is such that most people until, you know, just a few months ago around the world had never even heard or, or thought about this virus. Um, nevertheless, locally, it was understood to be kind of re-emerging. Um, shame on the world for not paying attention to that early signal that this was something uh, that posed a real threat to human health, in addition to posing threats to, um, to animal health and, and uh, ecology overall. Uh, what happened, uh, what had been happening was just very sporadic um, episodes where there was a bit of transmission to someone in a, in a Western country or in a non-Central or Western African country, uh, probably associated with travel and uh, there would be no further transmission. And so again, the world didn't really pay that much attention. One other exception to that is back in 2003, 
there was an outbreak of this actually on this continent. It was in some of the central United States. And uh, a little under 100 people were infected at that time with this virus. All of that was actually linked to, again, a zoonotic uh, transmission event. There was a shipment of prairie dogs, which are not dogs, they're actually a type of rodent. They're very cute, actually, if you Google what they look like. Um, but those prairie dogs had been transported from uh, West Africa together with um, some other animals that were subsequently found to be infected. And uh, through you know, uh, contact with those prairie dogs from pet stores to humans, uh, there was an outbreak of, of cases. But that ended uh, after a few months. Uh, no further transmission was seen on this continent or outside of Africa until May of this year. So what happened in May of this year? I think it remains to be uh, uncovered uh, exactly why this happened, but what was observed was that a number of cases of this unusual infection were seen in um, individuals initially in the United Kingdom, but also some other uh, Western European countries in Spain, for example, uh, and this is very, very unusual, again, because of the geography and it's not normally being seen there. Um, and uh, what happened uh, after that was, you know, as people started to sound the alarm and say, be on the lookout for this, of course, uh, jurisdictions around the world uh, started to, to notice it and report cases all over the place. Um, uh, here in, um, in Canada, uh, that was first uh, noticed in Montreal in the middle of May. And just days later, um, I can tell you that I had, I had the privilege of, of being involved in, in the uh, identification of our, our very first case here in, in Ontario. Um, and um, it was quite a coincidence. I had literally just seen reports that this was happening in the UK. I had reached out to some of my laboratory colleagues and said, you know, if it's happening across the pond, perhaps it'll show up here soon. Are we prepared? What, who's got a test that we could use to, to diagnose this? What's the plan? They said, no problem, Daryl, we'll let you know we're looking into it. And then two days later, uh, the, this patient um, uh, presented to medical attention. So that's a little bit about you know, the virus and, and the, the beginnings of this, this big epidemic that we've seen that's now affected well over 100 uh, countries in all regions of the world, uh, all continents, uh, all, all uh, regions of the WHO uh, health uh, categorization. Uh, I'm sure. Um, everyone's really curious to know, you know, well, what the heck does it do? So, so let's talk about that now. So that's the virus, that's the epidemiology. But what, what, what do people experience if they acquire this infection? Um, and, and really, it's a combination of, I, I like to think about three types of symptoms. So the first sim a type of symptom um, that I'll list, not necessarily the first one that the person will experience, is uh, flu-like symptoms, right? So most viruses, they make you feel lousy, your body responds to it. And that means that people can have these flu-like symptoms that includes things like um, a fever and headache and malaise and fatigue, and just feeling crummy all over. Um, it doesn't, um, well, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's the first set of symptoms. A second thing, and it's quite um, distinctive because it's not every single infection that does this, is many people do have pretty prominent, um, what we call in, me in medicine, you know, tender lymphadenopathy, which is a fancy way of saying tender swollen glands, okay, it's, uh, tender lymph nodes. Commonly, this is in the neck, okay, so in the, the what we call the cervical lymph nodes, and also in the groin, uh, so in the inguinal lymph nodes, they're called. So that's number two. And then number three, uh, and perhaps the most characteristic, uh, are the skin changes. So it does cause a very characteristic looking rash. Um, we can perhaps uh, share some links uh, later on um, in the chat and elsewhere that uh, are some nice resources for people to look at to kind of start to recognize it. But you know, the pox part of the name means that the, the skin lesions that this thing causes are very similar to many other uh, viral infections that we also call you know, pox type viruses. So of course, many people are familiar with chicken pox, also called varicella. And if you think about what chicken pox typically does, uh, people get rash all over the place. And the in the, if you look at the individual spot on the skin, what happens over time in a matter of days is it starts as a, a dot, or a red, red dot that quickly turns into a bump. Okay, and then it turns into a blister. That's the key. There's a, there's a period where there's actually visible fluid inside this little skin lesion. 
Um, and then what can happen in uh, in MPOX is that it um, it kind of ulcerates. So it, it starts to turn um, dark in the middle. Uh, it can kind of the skin can open, uh, break open, um, and uh, subsequent to that, it'll it'll scab over and eventually heal. So that whole process happens in each location that's affected, um, and uh, all of this can be very uncomfortable. Some people find it minimally uh, not a big deal, but most people find it really uncomfortable, really painful. Now, uh, if some of that skin stuff happens in a more kind of sensitive and moist part of the body, what we call in medicine the mucosal tissues, such as the mouth, such as the pharynx, the throat, or the, the genitalia, uh, or the rectum, it hurts like heck, okay? It hurts an awful lot. Uh, and one key feature of the whole phenomenon that we've been observing since the spring of this year uh, that, I've, uh, that, I've, that I've left out, but is really worth emphasizing is that uh, overwhelmingly, what we've been seeing is that cases of MPOX uh, have been occurring primarily in folks who self-identify as gay, bi, or other metrosexual men. At the beginning, back in May, it was something like north of 99%. Uh, that has slowly changed. It's slowly decreased. It's still it's, it's still well over ninety percent, uh, but it is um, uh, occurring in other settings as well. But what that told us unequivocally uh, from the beginning is that it was really spreading through sexual networks. Um, so so guys were having sex with guys um, and other you know, trans folks as well uh, who were having uh, sex with uh, with with guys or often cisgender but typically cisgender men. Uh, were, were quickly, um, um, unfortunately, acquiring this infection. Um, and uh, if you think about then uh, specific sexual activities that folks were engaging in, oral sex, anal sex, uh, that it makes perfect sense that people would, would have symptoms in that, those locations, right? The throat, the rectum, and of course, the, they were exquisitely painful and uh, you know, a lot of suffering that we've seen uh, in folks who have had that. Um, so in, in summary, uh, that, those are, that's the virus and the epidemiology. Um, the, those are the symptoms, right? So the flu-like symptoms, the swollen tender glands, and then the skin stuff, sometimes involving the mucosal, the mucosa, like the throat and the rectum. Um, those symptoms don't always occur in that order. Um, uh, and maybe the very last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say before I um, uh, pass it back to Miranda is, um, in terms of transmission, which of course uh, is, is something that, that I'm sure everyone's wondering about. Um, uh, although much of this isn't fully, fully worked out, uh, in addition to the animal transmission that we've always known can happen, the human to human transmission uh, we, we clearly uh, know is, is, has largely been happening this year through uh, in the context of sexual activity. So it, uh, it makes sense because we can find the viral, the virus on these skin lesions. Uh, uh, and in the in the throat and the rectum, when we take we take samples, it makes sense that if you're in direct contact with it through sex, um, uh, actual intercourse, actual oral sex, or even just kind of non uh, intercourse but sexual touch, just contact between between skin uh, and mucosa can can transmit the virus. What's less understood at this point is whether is the extent to which other modes of transmission are actually playing a role. So. At the beginning, we were talking a lot about and concerned a lot about the potential for respiratory transmission. So it's kind of similar to COVID, right? Everyone I think these days knows a little bit about this terminology about droplet transmission, right? Bits of spit that fly out of your mouth and nose just through coughing, talking, singing, what, what have you, close to someone, or even airborne transmission, just floating around in the air. We don't actually have great data at this point about how, how much that's playing a role in, uh, in MPOX transmission uh, right now, although uh, it's thought that it could be the case. And then finally, uh, there is always still the concern around what we call fomite transmission. That's transmission uh, using an inanimate object as the vehicle for transmission. Again, the whole gift of blankets, uh, quote unquote, is a great example of fomite transmission, which was definitely happening with smallpox. We don't really know for certain to what extent that's happening with, with MPOX, but because of the relationship between the virus, we suspect that it's possible. I would say it's not terribly well understood or documented right now, but we're operating as though that can certainly happen. So um, I think that, I hope that gives a decent overview of some of the key facts. Um, 
sorry, maybe I will just end by saying that we're fortunate that in most parts of the of Canada and of the Western world, cases have really uh, looked like they've, they've peaked in the summer, around July, August, and now that they're really coming down, but not gone. So um, uh, I'll pause there and uh, thanks so much for the chance to, to open with that background info. I feel like a lot of people are going to have beautiful questions for you, Daryl. There's a lot that you just said, and I feel like there's um, so much more that we need to know. Um, I wanted to introduce John Schellenberg. Um, John is, works as a research associate at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm Toba, actually. I, I'm at Manitoba. the University of Saskatchewan. You know, I'm not a prairies person. I think I've been there once. So to me, it's all like, it's all one thing. I, I did spend a couple, of, a couple of wonderful years at the University of Saskatchewan um, in, and lived in Saskatoon and, and loved it. Um, it's a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your research and a, a little bit more about yourself, John. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is John Schellenberg. Um, I'm uh, from uh, Treaty One territory. Uh, my uh, background is um, Irish, German, um, and Acadian. Um, my ancestors came here to, to Winnipeg, to Transcona, to work on the trains in the early, early, early 20th century. So that's my connection to this land. Um, I, I'm really uh, Honored to be here today with everybody um, uh, and, and uh, hearing that excellent uh, overview from Dr. Tan was um, uh, amazing, an amazing um, overview. And I just wanna hear about vaccinations and how vaccinations are going. So, uh, and how people are responding to the vaccinations and, and, um, and so on. That would be the question I have for you, but um, uh, yeah, so, um, I started working on HIV prevention stuff back in the uh, early 90s when I was a teenager um, and HIV was becoming uh, a really important thing in my community. Um, I, I was uh, around uh, uh, for the Winnipeg Men's Survey, which was one of the earliest um, studies of HIV seroprevalence in uh, gay and bisexual men in Winnipeg. and. Um, through that experience, I, I met my uh, uh, a really good friend and mentor named Dan Allman, who some of you may know um, for his really groundbreaking work um, on community-based uh, HIV research. Uh, a lot of his concepts are now, um, you know, uh, being operationalized through CIHR funding programs and stuff. Um, so yeah, so the Winnipeg Men's Survey uh, used saliva-based testing to um, uh, test for HIV for from people in bars, bathhouses, and uh, people working uh, in the sex trade in Winnipeg. Um, and it was the model for the the larger Ontario Men's Survey, which which followed it, uh, a large social behavioral examination of HIV risk. Um, th this led to a job at Village Clinic, uh, where I met uh, more uh, people who would become very dear friends and mentors uh, to me, including Margaret Ormond, who. Um, uh, has recently passed away. Um, Randy Jackson, who I think is here, and uh, it's been so great reconnecting with him through Feast over the last few years. But we met actually back in the mid 90s when we were both uh, working at Village Clinic on uh, providing HIV care here in Winnipeg um, and uh, really developing a lot of uh, HIV, innovative HIV prevention. Um, educational programs and uh, at that time there was a real transition between um, HIV being seen as a, a gay, gay man's disease or gay bisexual MSM disease and, and you know recognition that this uh, infection was affecting all people and um, that's a, a parallel that I, I would like to draw between what we're seeing now with monkeypox is is that sort of initial um, perception that that people aren't at risk because of who they are and the danger of, of that perception. Um, uh, that I hope that we can discuss that uh, uh, later on, maybe. Um, uh, so at Village Clinic, uh, we started a thing called The Living Room uh, in the mid-90s, and Randy uh, Jackson was really instrumental in making that happen, as well as Pat Stewart and Margaret Ormond and Carrie McCormick here in Winnipeg. 
this became Sunshine House over the years. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sunshine House because it's a really fantastic resource here in Winnipeg, um, providing uh, drop-in services for um, street-involved people, for underhoused people here in the core area of Winnipeg, as well as having a really a real focus on the LGBT2S uh, uh, TTQ community um, through their Like That program. And they do amazing drag fundraisers, drag bingos, which are just so much fun. And if anybody's ever coming to Winnipeg, please you know, plan to be here for one of the drag bingos because they're fantastic. Um, so when we heard about monkeypox in the middle of May, um, I was actually standing at the buffet table at the uh, Communities uh, Alliances and Network Skills Building Conference, which was held here in Winnipeg in May um, at the Fairmont Hotel. It was a fantastic conference. I think for a lot of people, it was the first conference that they'd been to since COVID. And it was such a fantastic experience meeting everybody involved in the feast uh, project and then the, the wider sort of can community uh, we saw amazing performances um, uh, by Jeremy Dutcher and, and others uh, fantastic dancing. Anyway, so I was talking to my buddy Katya and she said she mentioned about monkeypox and it was just like, you know, so soon after COVID it was just like, oh, you know, er everybody was just kind of like a bit winded I think and and um, when I emailed Levi Foy, who is the executive director of Sunshine House, he was kind of like, oh, we're not, I'm not ready for this. And I, I think there was a real perception there at the beginning that this was coming. And if we didn't do something, th this could sweep over us in, in kind of the same way that, that COVID had. And I don't know, a, a kind of pessimism, a kind of fear, um, uh, and also just tiredness, like exhaustion, like nobody like who wants to go there again, you know? And um, so within a week we had uh, information, uh, poster, pamphlet, uh, website development with the help of Jenny Hinkleman, who is their communications coordinator, she's amazing. Um, within a week we had information out in the bars and bathhouses um, and uh, it, it sort of built up to a, a webinar that Sunshine House hosted in mid-July about, um, about the monkeypox situation. Uh, public health uh, representatives were there, uh, physicians were there um, explaining kind of very similar to what um, Daryl just provided for us. And um, yeah, I think it, it, it really um, helped people to, or motivated people to get going on, on uh, what to do next. And, and that really turned out to be vaccination. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I, I might be overstating, but I think Manitoba was the first province to start uh, pre-exposure uh, vaccinations even before we had any cases here in Manitoba. Um, okay, sorry, excuse me. Hi, sorry, I'm just, I'm just sorry, Paul, sorry about that. Sorry, guys. Um, where was I? Uh, yeah, and, and to date, even though we still only have a single case reported here in Manitoba, um, almost a thousand people have been vaccinated through a variety of, of clinics. And uh, um, and so now that we, we're seeing the numbers go down overall, I, I'm kind of wondering how much vaccination has contributed to that, how much the, the thousand vaccinees here in Manitoba, um, you know, are, are blunting the ability of the virus to, to progress. Um, but I also, uh, um, according to Carol Kerbis, uh, a public health who, who uh, e emailed me this morning, demand for the vaccine has slowed and th they're kind of wondering what kind of messaging, uh, you know, might help uh, motivate more people to get vaccinated. And also the question of when to vaccinate beyond the gain bisexual MSM community, um, as Daryl stated, if the numbers have come down and, and there are other groups being exposed, is, is there um, a plan for, for that? Um, so yeah, so uh, I kind of jumped around a little bit, but my main job here at the University of Manitoba is, is um, in STBBI prevention research and particularly rapid testing. And, and we've been working on syphilis rapid testing for the last year or so uh, with a really cool, um, quite cheap, uh, device that is available now for for rapid syphilis testing, and and because monkeypox, you know, it's not the same kind of agent, 
but because it, it is sexually transmitted and, and results in sores similar to syphilis, I'm kind of wondering how, you know, syphilis prevention and mon monkeypox prevention, you know, might go together at, um, in terms of being able to diagnose, uh, uh, say, a sore swab, um, you know, what, if we could rule in syphilis or monkeypox sort of maybe right in the bathhouse, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of approach. So it would be a question I would have for Daryl is is um, how you see testing um, uh, being able to interrupt transmission chains and 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 how that might look outside of uh, of the gay bisexual MSM community eventually, if necessary. Um, I, I work with uh, Dr. Jason Kindrachuk here at the University of Manitoba. Some of you may know him or have heard him on the news. He's uh, often um, commenting on what's going on with COVID. His background is in Ebola, and, and um, so he's very familiar with the West African or uh, uh, that the situation there in terms of infectious diseases. And it, he said to me that he thought we should be paying more attention to what's going on in Africa right now because there is community transmission happening. And, and I think that's kind of our worst fear here in Manitoba is some kind of wider, um, you know, wider spread uh, to young families. I think that's that's our, our great fear. And probably, according to Dr. Kindrachuk, if we understood better what was happening in Africa, uh, where vaccines aren't as available as they should be, considering the amount of community transmission they have. Um, is that a harbinger of the future here? Or are, are we going to see this kind of disappear and become just an African problem again? Anyway, I have tons of questions. Um, I, 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 yeah, uh, I guess I'll stop there. Um, a bit rambling, sorry. No, I, I appreciate everything that you just said. I think it's really pertinent to all of the issues. And um, you made some really great um, questions, which I've written down, which we'll ask Cyril um, right after. Um, our next speaker introduces themselves. I'd like to introduce Albert Beck. Albert is the director of 60s Scoop at the Métis Foundation um, Federation. Please go ahead. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, thanks, uh, Catherine, for the opening prayer. I'm Albert Beck. I'm a citizen of the Red River Métis Peoples. Um, that is located in um, Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's the historic Red River Settlements. Um, as Miranda said, I'm the director for the 60s Scoop Department with the Manitoba Métis Federation. And um, I just just was listening to, I've just been educated, or I guess I would say I just got woke in terms of MPOX, um, in terms of the, the valuable information and education that, uh, you know, that uh, I received. And it reminds me of many, many moons ago in relation to the response um, and the experiences that I sort of have with regulations to HIV, and I do see a lot of parallels, as John has mentioned in his his comments. I think I, you know, as a person that is a 60s scoop survivor, um, I'm a family member of a missing uh, family member, and I'm an intergenerational survivor of the residential and day schools. I look at at the this whole issue. Uh, in relation to from a colonial um, like uh, lens and how um, this type of illness or this disease has sort of is another is another one of those um, illnesses that you know indigenous people sort of have to sort of weigh through and and really be um, um, need to be aware of and you know as in my experience as a as an educator I think information is extremely valuable and um, as, as as well as uh, at a vaccination and I know that within the HIV um, process you know education was really really important uh, and the and at, at the uh, access to medications was also another important feature of sort of kind of controlling and controlling this. Um, I kind of, 
going back to this idea <laughs> that you know we have to remain vigilant. Um, I think the super person that, that, in my mind, that usually is, you know, we kind of think of a super person that's, you know, fighting the fight and so forth. And we have many of those across the country that I, either through advocates or people live with lived experience or our medical, uh, uh, medical people, researchers, all working in tandem to sort of move forward on this. We have been a bit tired and we are a bit exhausted from the pandemic. And um, I can see when we talk to community-based organizations that are providing these services that they're tired, of, but also they're not they're not funded appropriately, um, and um, it's it's difficult. I mean, I look at uh, uh, Sun Sunshine House as an example of working really hard and trying to service the community based with basically very limited um, funds to be able to do that. So they are, you know, sort of having to do this like most organizations on the side of our, our desk. And so, you know, it doesn't get the, the attention that it really needs. But I, I, I was, uh, as, as uh, John was talking, he brought me back. He brought me all the way back to the beginning of the HIV pandemic when I first walked into the doors at the Gay Men's at Village, Gay Village, Gay Men's Village uh, Clinic. Um, that's where, um, I was introduced to, you know, STBBIs and 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 just basically overall health and access to uh, gay men's health, and of course that uh, changed over the course of over the course of the years uh, in Manitoba with the nine circles and so forth and so on. But you brought me back. You just brought me all the way back to the beginning, and I think about what the lessons. What lessons did we learn uh, from community? And one of the things that I found that, which is one of the lessons I think that's really important is the, the fact or the idea of education and getting the information out to the community. And that's one thing that I kind of, I feel like has locked. My first um, introduction to monkeypox was at AIDS 2022, uh, where uh, my husband and I were walking down, the, down into the gay village and a public health person asked if we'd like to get um, our monkeypox vaccination. And I was just like, <laughs> what, <laughs> why? You know, I had very limited knowledge, um, but my impression was it, you know, based on what I learned through the news um, was that it was affecting the gay population, but those that were uh, super active. And, you know, my mind goes to my, what my, um, behaviors and where I've been interacting and where I was interfacing and um, came to the conclusion or to the to my conclusion that that I I wasn't it I didn't need it plus it was too hot outside and I wasn't waiting outside <laughs> to get a vaccination but um, I guess when it goes back to education and, and understanding and just getting out to the community and sharing this information that's where the where a lot of that work needs to happen um, and I see that Manitoba's, you know, John, you've been doing that work in Manitoba, but for, here in Ontario, where I live, I, I don't hear anything about it. Um, I don't have access to the resources or information um, that would be required for help to help me to make an informed decision. And I'm a person that's really vaccinated out. Um, and I was talking to the to the group yesterday about, you know, these vaccinations and I'm virused out and I'm vaccinated out. And so trying to make these decisions as a person living with HIV, for example, and looking at trying to figure out the science around all these um, uh, these vaccinations and how they would interface with my, my antiretrovirals is concerning in terms of how many, how many things are in my body that are fighting how many viruses you know, at one time. And so, you know, just by listening to John, uh, John, you made me want to, you know, I'm coming to Manitoba on the 30th and I'm going to need someone to give me a vaccination for monkeypox because I think that's it's the right thing to do. It's just in terms of, of um, just overall um, peace of mind, uh, simply because I am interfacing in the public uh, and in so many different ways in the work that I do. And I work uh, with uh, 60 Scoop survivors, residential school and day survivors. And most of the, most of the people that I'm interfacing with um, are in the older demographics. And 
it's been the practice of the Manitoba Métis Federation in terms of the COVID-19 that we do everything in our power. In fact, vaccination is a policy within our organization. And so um, it makes sense in, in my mind, and this is just my personal thoughts that I would be looking at um, um, finding the way to get myself vaccinated, regardless of where I'm sitting as a in, in my in my mind. But I think education is a really important part in 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 in, in, in giving community or those in in the in the in in society the opportunity to make an informed decision. And um, and I I don't know if I I was I'm I'd like to know if Manitoba was the first province. I'm living in Ontario, um, but I am a Manitoba. Um, I'm from Manitoba, and I travel uh, extensively back and forth to to and from. Uh, for my work. So I think for me, um, going back and looking at lessons learned in terms of getting things out into the community and empowering community, and then marrying that with the scientific knowledge and providing that information um, to those that are at risk is, a, is probably a very important part of this process. And I know that I was talking to Dr. Tam yesterday a little bit about my perception and how things sort of moved in terms of the HIV pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the monkey po M pox um, illness. It's not a pandemic, but it's still uh, a situation that uh, we're that that you know we're closely monitoring and could explode into something more than what we're actually really realizing today. Uh, and and so, you know, I look at how, how perhaps maybe MPOX is an opportunity for us to sort of try to get it right. And it seems to me from just from listening that the information is getting out there uh, in Manitoba. I don't know if it's getting done across the jurisdictions in a coherent way. And we look at, for example, COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout in some of the provinces, for example, indigenous people fell within a different level uh, within the priority uh, populations. And in some provinces, for example, in Ontario, um, on Indigenous people were a priority uh, group. So I'm interested in the vaccine uh, strategy and questions around the vaccine process. And where can organizations really be um, helpful in moving forward and ensuring the populations that new, do need to have those uh, vaccines or that information, what 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 is their role in advancing that based on you know the limited resources that is out there? I don't see a strategy right now from the federal government or any government right now, in my view, that has a strategy for MPOX. But community is responding uh, and doing the work that they need to do. So as a person living with HIV, with a person that lives under, you know, lives, lives, lives in an urban setting um, that is, um, is becoming woke in terms of what this virus is and what it's about. Um, I think it's important um, that this information and whatever information we can get out to the community um, is out there. And from an indigenous perspective, um, this information would need to come out in a more culturally relevant, a distinct based uh, approach because um, uh, we may live in, in in certain areas, but our lifestyles and the way that we interface um, with one, one another is is very different, and our cultural um, protocols and, and and practices are are very different. And and so when we look at um, a ceremony, when we look at community gatherings, when we look at a number of different things, um, we need to be really mindful of how we are going to educate um, our citizens. I, as a, I'm a local chair for um, the Limichifo Tepimsawak, which is part of the government structure of the Manitoba Métis Federation, and I made an inquiry to our Minister of Health around what, what, what are we doing? Um, we've really focused on COVID-19 as a government as the government has has really focused on it because there was a lot of resources and of course um you know the pandemic was much different than what we're sort of dealing with right now 
But the question is, and always has been as an advocate for under HIV and SBBIs is what is, what is, what is our government doing? What is indigenous governments doing uh, to sort of get in, get, get ahead of the, get ahead of the game. Uh, and um, I was, you know, part of me again goes back to when we, when I first started, I remember going into First Nations communities, Inuit communities, Métis communities, and just doing MPOX or AIDS 101, and just going out there and just doing the conversations, opening the conversations and getting things motoring. I'm not sure if that would be the same mode, but I believe that we need to make sure that the population in our communities are educated. So I'm still waiting uh, for a response from our minister. And I will be speaking with her probably in the next couple of weeks um, and questioning her at our annual general assembly around what, what, what are we doing? Um, and I guess when I go back to that, I look at, you know, we are, um, we are exhausted. We are, you know, uh, there is a limited amount of funding and it's not the in illness yet. And I don't want to get to that to the in Ill, that in illness, uh, but I want to. I hope that I that we are able to sort of get ahead of this, um, so that we're not dealing with this. And I'm I'm happy to hear that the numbers are going down, but still those are people that are still being infected, and those are people. And uh, I love to be able to hear zero uh, if we can get to that. So. I, I guess I'm all over a map a little bit. I like to ramble a bit, but I, I do go back in time. Uh, there are there are parallels, and what can what things can we do differently, um, uh, and what what things can we take from the past and use in this particular situation? And I think that um, there has been many lessons learned, and I think that you know the organizations are pivoting. Um, to this, but I believe that they will need the resource, more resources to be able to do that. So as we're coming out of COVID-19, now we're going into MPOX. So anyway, that's how I'm sort of thinking right now, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you so much, Albert. I do have a question for you, Daryl, um, because in Canada, the numbers are going down. Um, but I remember watching this uh, webinar from Sunshine House that John sent around. Um, I'll put the link for that in the chat as well. Um, and back in July, they were stating that about 60 countries had been affected by monkeypox. And when you were giving updates, you were saying 100 countries. Um, so although numbers are going down here, globally, it's really changing. Um, do you have anything to add to that? How is that happening? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question. So um, there's a lot to say. Uh, I guess the kind of high level picture would be to say that uh, we clearly saw the current epidemic uh, begin, uh, or it was it was first noticed in West Western countries, right? Western Europe. Um, Canada, then the United States, Australia, um, you know, the, the global north or the, the west, if you will. And um, it was really, really concentrated in, in the sexual minority men, as we've said. Um, what we, of course, all know is that the world's interconnected. We also know that um, queer people were everywhere, right? And so it doesn't surprise us that uh, things that spread super, super quickly in certain parts of the world, it is just a matter of time before it gets elsewhere. We saw that with COVID, we saw that with HIV, we saw that with um, pandemic after pandemic. So none of this is a surprise. Um, one thing that we have perhaps in our favor in Canada uh, is that we are we were one of a handful of countries that at the moment that the epidemic was first recognized within our borders, we happen to already have this vaccine uh, licensed for approval by Health Canada. Now, for a different indication, it's a, a vaccine, uh, it's really a smallpox vaccine, okay, third generation smallpox uh, vaccine, replication incompetent is all the jargon that goes to describe it, but it's a, it's a vaccine that was designed because of the concern around smallpox primarily as a as a, a biological warfare agent. By extension, it was recognized that it could also therefore be useful against monkeypox uh, and pox. 
Um, and that allowed us to get a little bit of a head start. And I think really kudos go, uh, I, I don't know about that fact about a manageable being the first province to, to deliver this prep before uh, cases were recognized in that province. Uh, to the extent, I mean, that's, that's awesome to have that foresight. Uh, I will say, you know, kudos really go, I think, to public health authorities across this country that really did mobilize to deliver uh, this vaccine as soon as it could be done logistically. Um, and as Albert was describing, giving it out literally in the street, asking people, are you interested? And giving people that option, that choice, uh, doing that in the context of a, a global uh, HIV conference where we knew that there would be people from many resource limited countries where uh, access to this would be zero. Uh, that was uh, really, you know, wonderful. Uh, and I think uh, a, a lot of credit goes, uh, is due to public health authorities who often work under the radar and are not uh, recognized for these efforts. Um, all of that may very well have uh, a lot to do with the progress what we've been making in settling things down in Canada. But then the very last thing to say, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause, is that, um, you know, uh, as we've said before, it's been recognized that, you know, this, this epidemic has been really explosive in sexual minority men. Um, there is the question, you know, why did it happen now? What, what, what changed? What was special about the spring of 2022? There's lots of hypotheses out there, you know, people suddenly going out there and mixing because, you know, COVID was, you know, quote unquote over, which of course it's not, but uh, changes in behavior related to that. Okay, maybe, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, certainly there's um, questions around uh, whether the ending of the global smallpox vaccination effort uh, in, uh, you know, around 1980 uh, globally has led to a global population that is more now susceptible to viruses like this that is very likely to be true and, and a factor here but it doesn't explain why it would have happened this particular year at this particular time um a, a lot of uh, the a lot of this could have just been random like just one random travel event that went unnoticed that led to a bit of transmission that suddenly was detected that's very plausibly part of why this happened in other words not that much explanation is necessary or even possible but another potential uh, explanation for why now uh, kind of circles back to your original question, Miranda, which is that it's very possible as well that there has actually been a little bit of this virus circulating around the globe for way longer than we recognize. And that it just was this weird, you know, illness that someone had and it just kind of ended there and didn't come to medical attention because we know that this, this infection resolves spontaneously uh the vast majority of the time um and again in the context of transmission um through sexual networks in a community that is around the world marginalized discriminated against you know in many countries around the world it is literally illegal as we all know to even be identified as as, uh, as someone who engages in same-sex behavior uh, it's no surprise it should be no surprise that this would be hard to gather good information on, right? So that people would not feel comfortable stepping forward, seeking medical attention that they need and they deserve uh, because of these uh, structural forces of discrimination. So all that to say, it's also possible that some of the detection is actually picking up low level transmission that had always been going on, that just never came to attention because our eyes weren't looking for it. There's systemic structural forces that prevented people systematically from getting the care that they needed. Um, and feeling comfortable accessing health care services that they did. Thank you for answering that. Um, I'm going to go to um, a question that we have in the chat, but I haven't forget gotten any of your questions, Albert and John, we'll get there. Um, just this one is really uh, pertinent to the situation. So um, JS says, Dr. Tan, I think the initial indications we received that influenced risk assessments was that the early cases were being caused by the West African clod, which to quote the control of communicable diseases manual manifests without apparent human to human transmission and without human mortality. Are our cases in Canada still the West African clod? Has the virus changed? Or was the data slash investigations lacking to support the without human to human transmission statement due to the past geographic location of past cases? Good question. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Miranda, for reading that to everyone. And thank you, uh, uh, Jill, for, for the question. I'll try my best to tackle it. There's a lot in there. Um, and please feel free to, to engage uh, more uh, if, if, if there's other things we're thinking about um, that, I, that I don't address. I mean, so, so one thing, so maybe for everyone to understand, you know, what the heck is this word clade uh, that we're talking about here? Uh, it basically just means like, you can think of it as a subtype, right? It's, it's a microbiological way of subdividing different strains, if you will, of, of, of a virus. We talk about different clades of HIV um, and uh, different clades of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes um, COVID, and there are different clades of, of MPOX as well. Historically, one, one fun thing for everyone to just be aware of, one thing, uh, fun thing in terms of the nomenclature, you know, um, there have historically been recognized to be two different clades of MPOX virus. They have historically been referred to um, with reference to the geographic parts of the world in which the viruses have been um, recognized. There's also, I think it's worth us just uh, uh, sharing with each other that there is a movement to avoid that practice, right? To not name geographies, uh, countries, uh, and by extension people as, uh, and linking them directly with, with, a, with a virus that itself is stigmatized and you know, feared and all of that. Um, uh, out of uh, out of uh, respect and desire to um, promote like a stigma free uh, approach to uh, naming infectious diseases. So uh, typically now, what you refer to as clade two, uh, and clade two is what is largely um, what has been circulating globally. Uh, there's even been talk about how actually there's clade two A, which is historically what had been seen in West Africa, and now what we're seeing is clade two B. Uh, maybe that really should be called clade three. Anyway, but we'll let the the taxonomists debate this amongst themselves, but typically we talk about this being clade 2B. Um, uh, and um, I, the short answer finally is yes. I think uh, we, as far as we know, uh, the vast majority of what's been happening globally and in Canada uh, presently is this clade 2A. Um, uh, has, has it changed? You know, is this still true today? To what extent is it changing? Don't know. And what this really speaks to is the need to build more and more research infrastructure to look at this type of question. The way that we can learn this is to do genetic sequencing of the virus, right, right up uh, John's micro medical microbiology alley. I don't know if you want to say anything about that later on, but uh, there is capacity that is being built. Uh, we and others are, are uh, have amazing lab collaborators who are starting to do that work with virus isolates that we've collected from um, consenting participants in some of the studies that we have launched of, uh, of MPOX. Um, but that's how we would know. And uh, yeah, boy, do we want to know because there are things that have changed about the virus that have allowed it to spread like wildfire this past year. Uh, boy, do we want to know that and understand it better in order to better design our, our medical countermeasures. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question, but that's, if there's more, Jill, please, please jump in. I feel like that really did answer the question for me anyway. If um, Jill, you have any more comments that you'd like to make about that, please throw them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, something that uh, John has raised is about vaccinations. And um, right now there's a thousand vaccines that have been distributed in Manitoba. Um, so how are, the, how are the vaccinations going? Like, I know that it's provincially that um, these vaccinations are being distributed, um, but have there been any um, effects from vaccinations that you've seen at St. Michael's that might um, counter the like the goodness of vaccinations or what have you been seeing with the vaccines and how are, how are they working? Sure, I can try to try to tackle that. Uh, I was just trying to look up some numbers for us, but I can't find them in time. Um, Maybe uh, I'll try to distill it down to a few key facts about the vaccine. First, we've already uh, emphasized how this is actually a vaccine that's designed for, for, for smallpox. It's a third generation um, smallpox vaccine. It was really designed because of concern uh, about biowarfare, military recruits, for example, um, being susceptible uh, to this and needing a product that would be safe to give in uh, people who needed it, such as military workers, lab workers, um, who might have been immunocompromised. Okay, because earlier versions of smallpox vaccine had a small risk of actually causing a mild infection in those people because the earlier versions of the smallpox vaccine were live vaccines. 
Uh, this one is with a replication in, incompetence, so it doesn't replicate in the person, which is which is great news for other folks, for folks who are uh, uh, immunocompromised in some way. Um, so uh, how, how has it been going? Um, uh, I'm going to introduce another fun fact, a wrinkle into the, the story, just for people to under, to, to um, just to, to learn about what 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 we've what we've figured out. Um, initially, a lot of the goal, uh, um, you know, if we were in a room, I would love to ask everyone who's heard of ring vaccination, because that's a that's a term that people started to put into the news even during during COVID, and it it came uh, to many people's attention first in the public health world with Ebola. Maybe you can put up your virtual hand uh, for or give a thumbs up, maybe give a thumbs up in the reactions button. On your Zoom, if you've heard of ring vaccination, it's a, it'd be curious to know. Um, I would bring it up because initially, when uh, MPOX first kind of showed up, there was a lot of enthusiasm about using uh, this term, uh, ring vaccination, for which I see several thumbs up in the in the in the panels. Thanks, thanks, folks, um, to try to control it. The idea behind ring vaccination is if you've got a case of whatever infectious disease and you're concerned that it could be transmitted to other people around them, people who are in touch with that first person, maybe you could um, draw a hypothetical, a virtual ring around that first individual who's uh, suffering from an, a disease, an infectious disease, and identify this ring of people around them who are therefore at risk because they've been exposed to that first person. And we should vaccinate that, that group of people, that ring of people as our first priority in an attempt to kind of cordon it off, not allow for further transmission to the broader community. And some people even said that we should try to do multiple concentric rings, not only the people who are in, in contact with that first person, but contacts around them. That's our approach to many infectious diseases. We say, well, who else might be at risk here? How can we protect them? Do we, should we give them medications? Should we give them uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, immune globulin for some infections, in this case, a uh, vaccine? It was thought about for COVID as well. What was learned very early on in our efforts to use this vaccine, it's called Invenine, by the way, uh, that's the trade name, so you might hear that, Invanine. It goes by other names in other countries, just to remove the confusion. It's called Invanex in, in Western Europe. It's called Genios in the United States, just to keep us all on our toes. Anyway, in Canada, Invanune, um, giving it to the ring of contacts of a person was thought to be a really great idea. And we thought maybe we could use this as post-exposure prophylaxis, realize that someone's been exposed to MPOX from someone because they had sex with them, and uh, protect those people. Um, the problem with that, we very quickly learned, uh, kudos to the you know, public health authorities in Montreal who early on tried to do this, we followed very soon after in Toronto as well, uh, was that it was virtually impossible to identify uh, successfully those exposed contacts. And that makes sense, right? We know that a lot of um, uh, sex between guys happens anonymously. Sometimes it happens through, um, a, you know, uh, apps, right, where folks just don't really know the person and don't reliably have a way to get back in touch with them. And so it was something like 80% or something of uh, contacts that a, a person with MPOX might say that they were in contact with that the public health authorities just could not contact. So that rapidly meant that the whole PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP approach for MPOX fell apart uh, very quickly. And that's why we flipped, flipped to this pre-exposure prophylaxis or pre-exposure vaccination is the way that the new NACI, National Advisory Committee on Immunization statement that John's nicely put into the chat right now, um, refers to it as. Um, this approach was 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 favored and uh, great to hear that it was, you know, uh, pioneered uh, so early in, 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 in some uh, jurisdictions like Manitoba. Um, in other words, the idea is identify who is at high enough risk based on the epidemiology that we should offer it to them just to prevent it from the get-go and roll it out. So um, great to hear, you know, around a thousand in Manitoba, you know, the scale of the epidemic was just so huge in, in, the, in the, the larger cities, Montreal, Toronto, that I think the, the, the last count, I couldn't find the number, but the last count in Ontario is something like 35,000 or so individuals who've received at least a first dose. The vast majority of that in Toronto, the second largest in a concentration in Ottawa, uh, but it, it is an order of magnitude smaller because that's where the cases really, really were happening. Um, and yeah, it does seem like that really might be playing a role in uh, why the numbers are down so much. Other jurisdictions that were heavily hit by this um, outbreak, such as the UK, have also 
as far as I understand, reported a similar similar phenomenon of numbers coming down. Uh, but of course, time will tell. And I'll just remind us all of what was it, the summer, I guess, of 2020, when we thought that we had come down off of that initial curve. And then what happened? COVID came back for its second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth waves. So that is likely, unfortunately, to happen uh, with, uh, with, with any infectious disease. And this is no exception. Um, and I'd like to actually throw it out to all of you and um, just talk a little bit about um, what John brought up about the danger of perception of MPOX. Um, um, John, you had shared yesterday a, a little bit about um, how with syphilis um, cases went down and then we just stopped looking, just, you know, um, people stop being proactive about protecting themselves. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, as, as soon as you unmute. Yeah, um, uh, what would I say about, I mean, education, like Albert was saying, he was talking about the importance of education. And I kind of wonder about how to, you know, how to restart the, the kind of energy that, that did, used to exist around HIV prevention education that, you know, there was kind of, um, you know, a real boom in, in the production of educational materials and approaches and, you know, all kind of pre-internet in a way uh, that happened um, around HIV. And, and I also just can't help but think about the current context here in Manitoba where rates of HIV and syphilis are exploding. And, and, uh, you know, it's not like it's a new problem. The problem's been around for quite a long time, you know, in terms of, of outbreaks in, in groups of young people, um, and particularly young women. Um, and everybody gets alarmed. Everybody's really concerned. You know, the, the doctors are, you know, what can we do to stop this? But but there's, you know, what does monkeypox education look like when we're already have such a huge education deficit when it comes to HIV and, and, and syphilis? Um, and how do we revive, you know, revive some of that energy and, you know, some of the people that I work with, uh, here, uh, you know, they really want to get up to their communities. They want to, they want to be up educating in their communities. And there's a lot of will and desire to do that, go and give back to, um, you know, their, their home reserve and, and so on. But how do we get there? You know, especially post COVID, because COVID just kind of made a lot of things that were going on kind of collapse or be put on hold. How can we now kind of, you know, come out of that and, and revive um, some of the like, like HIV 101 kinds of, of things like um, uh, Albert was referring to and, and I really feel that there might be a gap there, you know, for especially for the younger generation. Although it seems like the internet has every piece of information you would, could possibly need, how do we redesign our educational approaches for the internet age and, and places where, you know, there's variable access to the internet? So you can't just depend on, um, you know, online things. Uh, so in terms of exhaustion, I, I'm kind of wondering about vaccine exhaustion in the wider in the wider population and, and if people will be reluctant to kind of get on another vaccine bandwagon. And the question I would have for Daryl would be, how do people feel after they take the vaccine? Is it like, I've heard uh, anecdotally here in Winnipeg that people get quite sick after the vaccine and, and that they require a day off work and that some people might, you know, need help, uh, you know, support, uh, nutritional support or, or other kinds of, um, help to sort of get through the ill effects of the vaccine. Anyway, I'm just kind of wondering how, you know, how people feel about that and, and whether that would, would be an inhibitor, inhibitor for people to get the vaccine. Should I, should I dive in and I'll try to tackle? I mean, I'll, I'll answer pretty succinctly actually, which is to say that, um, uh, based on the data and based on our own clinical experience, um, I would say that it hasn't been a, a striking problem. Certainly, there, there has been some um, 
AE adverse event surveillance going on uh, about uh, things that people are voluntarily reporting as a as a as an uh, as a side effect or an adverse event after vaccination doesn't seem like there's a, a concerning signal about anything being out of the ordinary at all. There's a more active um, study that's now uh, just getting getting off the ground called Canvas, which is looked at uh, used to look at lots of uh, vaccine safety questions for other vaccines. Um, so we'll have even more data in the future. But the short answer is it hasn't tended to be um, anything out of the ordinary with respect to what you'd expect with a typical vaccine. A little bit of soreness at the site. Yeah, some people might feel a little under the weather, but really nothing uh, striking has been uh, what, uh, what, what my experience and my colleagues' experience has been and, and what the early data seem to show it. Still Thank people you, are tired of, they're tired of, of I, I don't know, like Albert was expressing that sort of fatigue with sort of the medical interventions and, and how much can the organism take on? I guess the organism can take on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, that was something that a question that I had for Albert as well. You had mentioned about being like over vaccinated. And there's a lot of folks who are living with HIV or living with immunocompromised uh, medical issues. And uh, what type of advice would you have for folks when um, just from your own experience? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, what I what what no, it's a good question though. Um, I think ultimately when you look, you know, as a person that's sort of hyper vigilant in terms of my own health care, you know, I'm always going to sources where I can get the proper information. Um and you know, I think for me personally, I have to weigh out the pros and cons of you know getting a vaccine and you know taking taking whatever that comes i mean there's a high anxiety you know taking the covid-19 vaccine i mean i've had my fifth booster uh sorry i've had my fourth booster my fifth shot um and i was taking the bivariant uh, vaccine a couple of weeks ago and i can tell you like i've had the pfizer for the first four and taking the bivariant by variant, I guess it's called. Um, I was full of anxiety because it's a different vaccine. It's something that you know that's being administered um, to you know to the population, or and or more specifically to me, something that's you know new with the new science, the MR and MR five MR and NA um, um, vaccines are different from the other. So I had to really educate myself on a number of things and, and really take um, take it uh, with whatever information I, I could I could gather and then make the best informed decision. Um, I think a lot of the decisions I made was based on fear. Um, you know, and then of course secondary would be what what interactions. But you know, when I think about uh, you know, I mean I've I've expressed that I want to get my 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 vaccine for mpox, but now I'm all over the place in terms of how that emotionally, uh, you know, sits with me, in terms of like getting more data and figuring out what populations there are and and so forth and so on. And then there's the moral and ethical uh, conversation that you're having with yourself on whether or not um, you are, you know, should you go for it regardless of what the, you know, regardless of what they're saying. I mean, it's a conversation that you're constantly having. I think, um, you know, when I said I was vaccinated out, you know, I really kind of feel that way. I'm tired of having a sore arm um, with the vaccinations that I've had, you know, it's, and, and I'm not, these are not just the only vaccinations I'm, I'm getting. I'm, there are other vaccinations that I'm being, um, um, that I'm taking over the long term um, to to sort of prevent um, anything that could happen in in the future. So you know when I when I'm thinking about this, you know I'm thinking about you know the vaccination, the the my ability to get the information uh, and 
and so forth. But then I think about other populations that don't actually have that opportunity to get that information, those that are actively, um, um, you know, actively um, in different, living different lifestyles or not, not, not necessarily getting access to the information. And I, and I think there's a, a bit of a difference when we look at HIV, John was talking about, you know, we were doing things paper-based <laughs> in the, in, you know, in the, back in, in the, in the early nineties and, and even be, when this started, we now have, you know, like we have this now, we have these tools now that might be beneficial to get information out if there was a place that one could go uh, to get that information. Um, and I'm a TikTok person. I spend a lot of time listening to TikTok and those sound bites are very quick. If there was stuff like that we could use and our younger generation is using that. But again, it's not the, it's not the main vector because a lot of our people have connectivity issues and there's also um, access to you know, these type of, 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 of things. So we need to really think about um, getting that information out. But yeah, I think, you know, when I think about my own experience uh, through the COVID-19 and I take an injectable for HIV, so I'm constantly getting needles all the time. Um, but when I think about my own experience, um, when it really kind of boiled down to when I was gonna, why I was taking this vaccine, it wasn't really, really about for me. It was about protecting my family. It was about protecting my husband. It was about protecting my community because I'm in the community. I'm out there. And so it became secondary. Yes, it was going to protect me, but I was more thinking about what's going to happen in my community and who I'm going to be interfacing with. And COVID-19 is rampant in the Métis community right now. Um, it's really taken... It's it's taken a foothold um, in our community, and we are, you know, trying to the gov our government is really pushing for vaccine uh, um, vaccine clinics and all these different things that are going on the campaigns and the information going out there. So there's one thing about the information that it, you know the population needs to know, but they also need to know about the vaccination, what treatments are available, and that um, those treatments. I wish they would have been giving treatments for HIV for free, like they did for COVID nineteen and and uh, and now uh, Mpox, because maybe that could have changed the direct the trajectory for um, the HIV pandemic. So yeah, so I I I don't know if I have a, a an answer to the question, but I think there's a number of factors uh, when making a decision, and then looking at how which vehicles are, are going to be used to to help people make that informed decision. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just a word of mouth. So when I'm talking to another community member and telling them to go get their COVID-19 vaccine, they're taking my word, my word for that because they know, and I tell them that I've taken it. So I'm a person that's taken the COVID-19, you need to go get it. It starts in the family and it percolates across, the whole family starts to call and it, kind of works in that way in the aboriginal um, uh, way it comes from word of mouth so people that have in the community that are, are advocates people that are working in the sciences and the researchers uh, people that are working in public health people that are working in the prevention field in their communities are going to be the source of, of information and uh, and the person to go to they normally are in my family i'm the go-to for pretty much a lot of the, a lot of the information, my we have nurses and in the family, those are go-to for primary healthcare <laughs> advice. But when it comes to different other things, there I'm the go-to for that. So, yeah. So hopefully, I just shared a little bit of light. Yeah, I really do believe that you did so. And um, Daryl, I'm going to ask you the same question, but then also Randy Jackson's put into the chat, um, can we or should we apply harm reduction principle, particularly for those who are vaccine hesitant, or can what might harm reductions and MPOX look like, um, but also in other words, aside, aside from being vaccinated, what else can we do to protect ourselves? Yeah, it's such a good question, Randy, uh, you're asking and uh... I just want to blend uh, my thoughts on it together with some of what Albert just said and, and see what John thinks and, and all of you actually think about some of these really important topics as well. Um, I think maybe it'd be helpful to start with what Randy's asked, you know, what other prevention strategies are there? And 
And of course, at the very, very beginning, that's all we had to rely on for COVID, for, for, for MPOX. Uh, and that's, it's really, really worth us emphasizing. This remains, um, you know, vaccine, we're privileged in Canada to have any vaccine at all. We don't have enough compared to what we want, but we're privileged. And many other countries in the world who have had MPOX for decades have zero vaccine, right? So uh, this uh, speaks to a global inequity. The, the supply of these uh, of these tools is, is not what it should be. And uh, there's global forces at work here that we need to advocate uh, for, for change with. Similar to, to Albert's call for universal ARVs. My goodness, do I applaud that call. So thanks, Albert, for that call out. Um, Okay, so what do we have? Absolutely, uh, of course, uh, it starts with, you know, um, behaviors, right? We know that this is an infection that's transmitted uh, through close contact. What type of close contact? We've learned that it, it is largely happening through sexual close contact. Does it have to be penetrative sex? No, probably not. Uh, most people that we've seen with it have report some form of sex, whether oral sex or, or anal sex, uh, sometimes uh, vaginal or front hole sex, but um, uh, sex is a big part of it. Um, but there is the, the risk of some transmission through close contact, uh, you know, either perhaps in the household setting, there's been a tiny, tiny bit of that in other jurisdictions, very, very little, if any, in Canada that I'm aware of. So uh, what can we do? I mean, many of the folks that I see in clinic actually uh, have, have been telling me, you know, I've chosen to just not uh, be as sexually active as I would otherwise be this summer because MBOX. Uh, and, you know, power to them for making that informed uh, decision. That's not a decision that's right for everyone, though. And folks will uh, choose to do what they uh, would like to do with their sexual health. And we should celebrate that and, and support that and be sex positive. So um, uh, what else can be done? I think it speaks to some of what John was talking about earlier uh, is, is testing. So if you, you can't, you can't diagnose, you can't treat, you can't prevent what you don't even know is there. So of course we need good testing. Certainly um, that was a huge problem at the beginning, lots of logistical problems that diagnosing MPOX was really, really tough back in May um, and even in early June, but it, it's gotten better and probably not worth a huge amount of discussion. Some of the issues I'm thinking about just might just distract us from the issues right now. Um, so that's uh, part of it, you know, having access to good testing so that people who have something going on can get it checked out to find out whether it's this or, or something else. Um, uh, but unfortunately, even those strategies aren't going to be aren't going to be bulletproof because it's it's, um, it's almost certain that there is a good chunk of M plus transmission that happens in the you know what we what we like to call the pre symptomatic phase or the you know you might even say posse symptomatic, which is a fancy way of saying in the setting of very minimal symptoms, if any, uh, that transmission could still happen. In fact, some of our very first cases that, that I had the privilege to, to be involved in the care of here in, in Toronto, um, you know, we, we, we identified someone who absolutely must have had it. And when we had a conversation with them in a really you know, open, welcoming, supportive way, uh, they trusted us, they, they, they came to us because their partner had advised that they come to us, they were happy to have the conversation. We presented this information. They were flabbergasted. They found it really hard to believe that they should they, they could have had this infection because their symptoms were so mild. Um, and in some of the, the data that's coming out, the vast majority of folks who have a confirmed diagnosis of MPOX have said that to their knowledge, they've not been with or been around or had any contact with anyone who is known to have had the infection or known to have had symptoms that are kind of like suspicioned, you know, for this. So uh, almost certainly there's, there's a lot of transmission that, that is happening um, uh, in the absence of clear symptoms, which makes it really tricky to try to um, halt with behavioral measures alone. So, um, you know, that's what I'd say around, um, around, um, uh, around uh, yeah, prevention strategies, I would I would say even that that uh, the vaccine to to some extent is actually also a harm reduction uh, approach, right? It's not bulletproof. We have seen I have seen uh, folks who have had MPOX um, after their dose after one dose of Invimune, um, even in folks who have had uh, Invimune the vaccine, you know, uh, long ago enough that you would have expected it to have you know kicked in. Uh, immunologically. 
So it's not perfect. Um, it is uh, a strategy for reducing harm in the setting of someone who is out there and, and, and um, at some ex risk of exposure, be it through sex or otherwise, uh, we want to support them in their decisions. And, and this is a tool that can help achieve that. Um, uh, one of the, I'm still thinking a lot about Albert, what you were talking about, about, you know, what about the, the idea of, um, you know, uh, being, being over vaccinated or, or how, uh, being kind of fatigued by vaccines. This is a really real issue. Folks, of course, still uh, talk about this and experience it with, with COVID vaccines. And it's a real, um, really important human issue. It's a really important public health issue that we need to find strategies that speak to people that work for people. You know, some of the, you know, uh, from a from a pure biomedical perspective, some of the information that I have sometimes shared with folks um, in the context is that, um, you know, if we look at the routine childhood vaccination schedule in every part of this country, um, most parts of the world, in fact, in the span of a year, the average in infant will receive a couple dozen vaccines, right? They'll receive multiple doses of vaccine. Again, it's diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, polio, mufflus influenza B, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, varicella, uh, uh, meningococcus, pneumococcus, and then they'll get many of those over and over. So the, the, uh, in, in the HIV clinic setting, you know, as people enter into care and they, they seek uh, um, what, what medical recommendations we have to offer, that does include vaccines against hepatitis A, two doses of that, hepatitis B, three doses of that, uh, pneumococcal infection, a series of two repeated with a booster five years later, annual flu shot, now COVID shots, um, and uh, what am I forgetting? Um, HPV vaccination, if I haven't had that, Gardasil 9, three doses in a row over six months. So the press, and, and, and it's worth pointing out, folks who are willing to accept the recommendations uh, willingly participate in that care, um, it goes really well, right? In the childhood setting, we know this is what allows our, our, our society to have, you know, virtually eliminated many of those um, uh, infections within our borders. And so um, I think there's definitely something about the exceptionalism of COVID and the exceptionalism of MPOX and how, as I, I think exactly as you, you discussed, Albert, how we communicate that, how we educate about that, how we think about it. Uh, and how we can together, you know, come to think about it that we can maybe tweak um, to 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 help advance the use of these tools that we we really do think do have benefit uh, with with truly minimal harm based on the data, um, but th that which rightfully so many people do not perceive to be the case, and that's uh, that's the that's the really important piece that we have to be sensitive to people where people are coming from. The, historical reasons, the structural reasons that people may have uh, uh, trepidation. And um, uh, I think these are great questions for the whole group to weigh in on. Yeah, I wanted to also mention, and, and I like, John, I'd like to hear your perspective about a harm reduction approach to this as well. But I've noticed for myself, my friends are mostly under 35. Everyone's on the internet. Everyone's using dating apps. Um, there hasn't been a change. There hasn't been a conversation of monkeypox. There hasn't been a conversation about vaccinations. So um, I'd like to know, yeah, I'll look just a little bit more and like maybe how can folks um, who are using dating apps, who are dating multiple partners, who are in polyamorous relationships, really like support their health and like protect themselves from um, things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Randy's question about harm reduction um, is, seems like really pertinent, and it, it does kind of seem like it, it kind of, it's kind of like an all or nothing, like you know, either being sexually active or not being sexually active. Um, and of course, for many people, it's not possible to not be sexually active or or to be just with one partner. Um, so, uh, like in terms of harm reduction, I, I think messaging around condom use um, can be quite similar uh, to, uh, you know, the way that condoms protect against syphilis and herpes, which is to say, incompletely, because only the parts of the body that are covered um, will uh, be protected against the transmission of the 
the, the virus um, or bacterium. Um, but again, uh, those condoms are protect protecting the most tender spots in the body as well. So if we were talking about, um, you know, some of the very painful uh, proctitis and uh, uh, rectal lesions that are, are really um, are very frightening to me um, uh, to consider having that myself and, and are probably, you know, the worst uh, potential outcomes from a monkeypox infection are these very painful mucosal um, lesions. So I think from a harm reduction perspective, condom use, um, you know, with, with people uh, with unknown, with anonymous partners, um, for example, um, you know, would be a good harm reduction recommendation because you are, you know, you might still get a lesion because of skin to skin contact, but then um, that lesion you know, wouldn't be in the most tender spots in your body. So, um, yeah, it's a, a harm reduction message there. Maybe I, I um, I would like to know a little bit more about um how the lesions manifest. Um, whether the the lesions tend to arrive all at once and heal in unison, or whether the um the uh, lesions pop up at different times and have different healing trajectories. I'd also have questions about, um, you know, secondary bacterial infections, uh, skin infections that might happen because of, of uh, sort of sores um, providing an opening into your bloodstream for lots of lots of things. Um, so yeah, so I, I hope that kind of answers the harm reduction side of things. Like, you know, there are things that you can do that are, are currently um, recommended for, for other STBBI that, that um, you know, to protect yourself from the worst outcomes of monkeypox. Um, I just wanted, I see Doris asked a question here about the, the need for more sexual wellness clinics. And I think that's a really good um, uh, example of, uh, you know, a community group coming together and organizing medical care for their community. The Ask Anti program um, was just uh, held an outreach clinic at um, a park here in Winnipeg last week uh, during our two-spirited, our two-spirit powwow, um, which happened uh, last week. And so the Ask Anti band was there and they had to turn people away at the end for, for um, uh, STBBI screening. So, uh, the demand is there, I, and and I think the answer to your question, Doris, is that no, we don't have enough of this, but that there are, I think, a number of of initiatives happening. I, I don't know much beyond what's happening in Winnipeg, but I, I know in Saskatoon and Regina as well, um, uh, outreach focused STBBI clinics, and and again, rapid testing really does help with that setting. You know, it, it's a a, a real. Uh, um, benefit in an outreach setting to have more rapid kinds of tests. And I kind of wonder, especially with monkeypox, whether being able to tell somebody right then and there if the sore on their junk is syphilis or herpes or monkeypox or some or just a zit, you know, would be um, a, a really, I don't know, a, a real powerful direction to go into. If, if I don't know if there's any rapid tests on the horizon, um, but it just seems like it would be so helpful to let the person know right then and there, okay, don't, you know, anyway, encourage people to not spread it. And I think people want to know so that they don't spread it. Anyway, sorry, that was a bit rambling. But... No, I think that's a really great question. I just want to repeat um, this question here in the chat. Um, do you think we need, more sexual wellness clinics like the Ask Anti Mino Bimbad. Mino Anish, hmm? It's the Mino Pematuswin uh, Sexual Health Lodge um, uh, that has started up in Winnipeg here in the last uh, in the last few months. Um, I don't. Um, I think we don't have enough community grounded and culturally grounded initiatives for Indigenous communities. And actually that turns me to uh, one of my final questions here for um, everyone, but also mostly for Albert. Um, there's been a lot of issues with vaccines in Indigenous communities. Um, like for example, the Saugeen First Nations community were given expired COVID-19 vaccinations. And I know that 
um, talk in our communities has been like, a lot of people are against vaccines um, or like medically driven initiatives like this because of like a really bad historical past. And um, yeah, I talked a little bit about like culturally respectful approaches and like how, um, I'm, I'd like to just ask you a little bit more about that. Like um, we need more community grounded and culturally grounded initiatives in indigenous communities, but also how do we get there? It's, it's a good question. And I think, you know, if we follow our, you know, our cultural practices in our communities, you know, in my community, um, as a person that is, an, you know, an advocate within the HIV movement um, for the past 30 years, um, I'm considered an elder in my community in the work that we do, I do. And part of that, part of the responsibility uh, as that knowledge holder and keeper is keeping up on your game uh, in terms of the information that's available, both scientific, medical, and uh, prevention um, information and being able to be sort of drawn um, brought to the table, so to speak, when asked to provide advice and uh, and direction as 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 a person that holds that knowledge. And um, I think where things kind of break down is because of colonization, um, because of the differences in the way that information is understood, developed, and past, you know, um, we're and actually this is an like interesting conversation because um, there has been some conversation around science and how science, um, you know, the search for answers from a colonial European perspective, um, in and the drive for knowledge development is really focused on the academic and building. Um, the career of a science or researcher. And that's incomplete, kind of sometimes bit in, the, in a different direction when we talk about from an Indigenous perspective, when we have um, what we're trying to do in our communities when we start to talk about inquiries and trying to solve a problem in the community is bringing the knowledge keepers together and then trying to use that knowledge and transfer it and you or use that knowledge develop the knowledge holders abilities or the community's knowledge uh, to be able to make informed decisions or pass that information on to their families and so forth and so you know it, it's not a stone throw away when we see uh, uh, you know apprehensiveness in terms of wanting to you know take a lot of the information that's coming from externals, it's not coming from you know the internal. It's coming to us externally, um, into our communities, and then we are having to sort of you know navigate and try to figure out you know the information. And because of the trust, um, the trust, in my view, is has has broken down, and even even in our own communities. Um, those that sometimes do actually have the knowledge that information isn't being accepted. And so we we have to really go back um, and really sort of rely on, on the way that um, information or processes or how community, um, you know, um, focuses or addresses these issues. And, you know, to hear, you know, um, vaccines that have expired, to hear that Indigenous people aren't a priority group when it comes to the vaccination process um, and a number of other different things. You hear that through the news or you hear that through the moccasin grape, moccasin line. Um, it really does create, um, you know, sort of a, a, a storm, so to speak, that can really prohibit um, you know, movement of, you know, information and approaches that Indigenous people 
um, would need to take in terms of that. The other component to this is is the belief around illness. You know, um, you know, at one point in my life, I believed that HIV was a virus. It was biological. It was attacking me, and it was attacking the human human race. And over time, I've moved that into more of a spiritual context. Um, and look at HIV, for example, as a, as a teacher. And look at COVID-19 as a teacher. I'm looking at it from a different perspective. And so, you know, um, although the effects of HI or HIV, COVID-19, um, these different viruses that are circulating in our society um, have, you know, some negative um, um, outcomes, that what we're not paying really attention to is what teachings are they giving us and what should we be paying attention to and so the world really learned from COVID-19 that a pandemic can level a complete society or a complete world globally and slow everything right down right and so you know when I look at you know when we look at that from an indigenous perspective um, maybe the way that we look at um, illness, how we look at uh, viruses, how we look at the different things, not necessarily, you know, the transmission, but what some of the messages would be um, from these particular teachers that are coming to us, um, then it makes, you know, it makes um, the way that we sort of look at things and we look at illness or disease in a different way than sort of maybe from Western medicine perspective. So, yeah, I think. Um, um, I go back again to education and 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 trying to utilize the the cultural um, and cultural practices or or governance practices or indigenous ways of learning and transmitting information to where it needs to go in a way that uh, the community can buy in. It's the same principle. If you're going into a community, I'm not going to go speak with somebody. Uh, about something until I till I meet an elder, um, and I get I get the the clearance, sort of say, to be able to go in and and work or to meet. I need to figure out who I need to speak to. Usually, the elder or somebody's going to tell me where I'm going to need to go, and if they're telling me that I'm not welcome, then that's that's another you know that's a, that's those are instructions. So you know there there are protocols in our communities um, that really. Um, that need to be uh, honored and, and, and practiced when we are looking at um, these different circumstances, no matter what they are, health or social or anything of that sort. I think that's my thoughts on that. Um, it's been a really good conversation. I love this uh, ability to be able to share from a community perspective, because I think when we look at, um, you know, the, the, it, the individual or collective experience um, that we, we when we talk about you know viruses or the mpox or any uh, virus, it really needs to have a human element as and and, and as well as the biomedical and, and research uh, elements. And I think blending those all together in this conversation has been really really helpful um, for for not for me if as a learner I'm constantly learning, but I think it's been a good conversation. I think something that needs to continue. So thanks. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, all of you. Niao uh, Goa, which means thank you so much from the great um, piece of my heart in Mohawk. Um, I am really grateful for this entire conversation. And I think that we've brought out a lot of um, very uh, culturally relevant, but then also um, very like pertinent information on MPOX. And also, I really appreciate. Um, this new I like this idea of calling it mpox rather than uh, monkeypox um, that you brought forward, Daryl, because yes, it does eliminate a lot of stigma that people have had a, around this. And maybe with um, this type of like name change and so forth, more people will be um, able to like comprehend that um, there is more of an issue happening here, um, especially for the greater public. Maybe it'll be become a little bit more uh, relevant. Um, but I think that we've covered all of our questions that have been in the chat. 
And I think that we've had an amazing discussion and um, I wanted to throw it out to all of you um, that I'm just sincerely grateful for today. Um, I'd like to ask Elder Catherine Martin to um, come back and um, close our conversation today. Um, are you there, Catherine? Yes, yep, I'm here. I've been here all along, just not easy to get back in. So, uh, Walaliok to all of you. And boy, I think this is just the beginning of a conversation. So, I agree with the panelists who said that um, this has to keep going. Um, and I think it's great. I, I try to be an optimist and say that what has come from COVID and HIV and AIDS is the ability for us to gather right now, right here to address this issue. I think that has, um, you know, it's trained us to, to address things as they come, but it's given us the infrastructure to do it. And I'm really, I, I just look back um, when I first started working with Can and when I for, in uh, First Nations AIDS Task Force, and we've come so far, and I, I feel um, I'm not happy about the MP, but I like the uh, new name. I just think um, we're in better positions to deal with it, and and it's because of all of you. Not just the panelists, but I was so impressed that we have this doctor who can come right on and speak to all of us in a way that we um, we can trust. So thank you. Walalani. Walalio. just um you just give me so much hope of the conversations we've had leading up to this and you know you're going to be one of those in the lead to with the background and the research you're doing and uh, i appreciate that okay thank See you all. okay um please take a look at our face website and you'll be able to find this conversation online to share with your classrooms to share amongst your faculty and so forth. So thank you again for um, joining us today. Okay. Ona, gagami.